Wow, Paul, this is a remarkable place. I had no idea in the central interior we had a, a forest ecosystem like this. I know it, it really is remarkable and it, it is, has been a, a well-kept secret. Um, so we're looking at one part of the northern end of the interior wet belt. So this is part of the interior cedar hemlock biogeoclimatic zone. Uh, these forests that we're standing in right here are only about 100 kilometers east of Prince George. We're only five kilometers off Highway 16. So many, many people travel that highway and have no idea that, that there are things like this so close at hand. Um, what we're looking at here are uh, primarily cedar-dominated stands that uh, were the trees are obviously quite impressive, but we really don't know how old they are. Most of the tree stems are hollow, so there's really very little sound wood uh, where, to allow you to count tree rings. So you can't age these trees in the way that you normally would. Um, so depending on how you would extrapolate the growth rates from the rings within the outer rim of sound wood, these trees are easily several hundred years old, perhaps a thousand years old. It's, it's really hard to know. But the, the great age of these trees and other features of these ecosystems really uh, reflect the special combinations of, uh, of, of climate and topography that we have in this part of the upper Fraser River uh, basin. Um, these are lower slope forests, so we're at about uh, 900 meters elevation. Uh, fires are very infrequent in this, uh, in this type of moist climate. And so as a result, we end up with stands that look a lot like the forests that we would see in many parts of coastal British Columbia, either on the mainland or on the, on the uh, Vancouver Island. The uh, features that we find in the soils that also are, reflect this environment and the way in which it influences soil forming processes um, re include uh, a much more uh, significant accumulation of organic matter so we see much thicker forest floors than we would see west of here in the interior plateau. The, that would reflect in part the productivity of these ecosystems, so there's a lot more input of organic matter. It also would reflect the fact that, that uh, we have much less frequent disturbances by fire. Um, we also see higher concentrations of carbon accumulating in the mineral soils compared to soils farther west of here in, in drier climates. Um, we, we call this a, a, an inland temperate rainforest, but unlike in coastal British Columbia, much, a much greater proportion of the precipitation would be in the form of snow. So the typical snowpack here by late winter would be two, three meters or more in some years. So there's a lot of moisture which tends to flush through the soil in a fairly concentrated period of time uh, during snow melt in the spring. And uh, we see evidence of this in, in lots of uh, lateral drainage occurring uh, through these slopes. So there's lots and lots of seepage occurring. So the soils will uh, tend to be uh, highly leached. They're, they're acidic, but they also contain lots of carbon and they contain um, uh, sufficient concentrations of uh, weathering products and iron and aluminum that, that uh, would make them podzolic soils. So let's go have a look at a typical example of, of one of the soils that we find in this part of the interior wet belt. And I think I can point out some of these features and how they indicate the operation of these processes. Okay. Oh, one of the things that impresses me uh, right off the bat with this uh, soil profile is how deep the organic layer is on the surface. Can you explain uh, why that's the case? Sure. Well, th this is really a very typical view of, of a forest floor in, in the, this part of the interior cedar hemlock zone. The, the thickness of the forest floor that we see exposed here ranges from about 12 to almost 20 centimeters. And that's uh, two to three times as thick as we see maybe only 50 or 60 kilometers west of here in the, in the subboreal spruce zone in the back, out on the plateau. So this is a result of a couple of things, one being the, the, uh, the productivity of these ecosystems, so the, the greater production of litter, also the fact that we just have such infrequent disturbance by fire, so this material can accumulate to a much greater 
degree than we would see in forests that would burn more frequently. The other thing that you can see exposed here is the different uh, types of organic material and in particular you notice this reddish brown horizon right here. So this is a, a part of the F horizon which is composed entirely of rotting wood. So it's really obvious here when it's exposed in the in the soil profile, but when you look at the at the surface, it's not really it wouldn't really strike you as being uh, large has a, having such a large component of woody material. So woody detritus does make a big contribution to the forest floors in these and and other forest ecosystems. So the overall accumulation then is is uh, that we see of 12 to 20 centimeters is pretty typical for the interior cedar hemlock zone, and that's a reflection of the environment as it affects that that process of organic matter accumulation. Mm -hmm. The uh, alluvial horizon, the A E or A H E, is not that strongly expressed. You can see it's a bit lighter looking here where it's dried out, and then we have a B F horizon down here, which is uh, has a more reddish brown color which gradually fades out with depth until we get into the BC horizon which has some mottling present as well down just below where my hand is. One of the other uh, surprising things to me was the fact that there's water in the bottom of the pit here and uh, I'm not sure I expected that. Why is, why is that? I know it does seem a little surprising because we are on a, a mountain slope uh, but we are here at the end of the spring snowmelt period. So perhaps as recently as uh, five or six weeks ago, there would have been a couple of meters of, of snowpack. And so we're just looking at the, the final stages of the, the, uh, the dispersing of the spring snowmelt. And we still get a lot of lateral flow through these soils. Um, the material that you see here is, is obviously uh, got lots of coarse fragments in it. Um, this is a morainal deposit with uh, many large uh, cobbles and small boulders present. So we, we get, these are generally fairly permeable soils and we get uh, quite a lot of lateral seepage occurring on these mountain slopes. So it's not surprising that we would see a lot of water in this pit at this time mm -hmm. of year. So from a, an ecosystem function point of view, we're worried about flooding in the Fraser uh, watershed, but this implies that this uh, mountain slope here is retaining some of this water. It's not all running off quickly and uh, maybe that helps with the... That's right, and ecologically as well, we, we see uh, the influence of all of this water on the soil uh, forming processes. So when we have two or three meters of snowpack melting and flushing through the soil profile, this contributes to uh, not only a lot of leaching, but it accelerates the acidification of the soil and, and the flushing away of weathering products. And so uh, this, this soil would be uh, classified as a humoferric podzol, which indicates that we've got uh, an accumulation of weathering products in the, in the B horizon here, which is sufficient to, to make it a podzolic B horizon. Now, another surprising thing for me is this is a podzol, but when I look at those colors, they seem kind of muted. That's right. And it's certainly not as spectacular a color that, as you would see in the B horizon of uh, a sandy soil, and there are sites like that not too far from here which would look uh, much more dramatically colored. And I think there's, there's partly a simple explanation for that, uh, which, which lies in the, uh, the influence of soil texture. So the textures that we have in this soil are primarily loam. Uh, so there is a lot of silt in this soil. So when you have a soil with a high proportion of silt, it's going to have a larger surface area than a soil that contains uh, mostly sand particles. So when there's a larger surface area, present in a soil horizon, it takes more material to, to color that surface. So as a result, even though the amount of extractable aluminum and iron and the amount of organic matter in this B horizon is comparable to or greater than we find on podzolic soils nearby on sandy materials, uh, it, it doesn't result in as dramatic a color expression just because there's a lot more surface area that has to be colored. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I notice about this uh, soil profile as contrasted with some of the 
clay soils we've looked at is the depth of rooting there. Could mm -hmm. you talk about that? Sure. It's a process. Yeah, well, we see a, a fairly deep penetration of the medium and some coarse roots well down into the bee horizon, uh, and that uh, reflects a couple of things. One is that, that we just don't really have a root restricting layer here, so there's no dense uh, hard uh, BT horizon present that would, pre would prevent roots from, from uh, penetrating farther into the soil profile. And the second thing is that even though we do see this uh, temporary perched water table, this is a very transient feature. This only exists for a very short period of time, right during and immediately after the spring snow melt. So this is going to be gone in another week or two, and it really has no effect on the distribution of roots.